So a little story about listening. So my wife and I were early on in a relationship before we were married. And I was early on in my career, and I drove a really, really ugly car. I drove a 1977 Ford Granada. I apologize if that's your car. <laughs> but this is a really, really ugly piece of junk, right? Now, my wife had a nicer car. She had this really new two-door blue Toyota Celica. She was going away for a month to do some work, and she'd made this really generous offer to me. She goes, hey, while I'm gone, I know your car is a piece of crap. You're welcome to drive my car. I said, that's so nice of you. I appreciate it. I think I will. And she says, OK, do me a favor. Uh, just mail this in for me while I'm gone. It's really important. I said, OK, I'll mail that letter in for you. No she goes, no, listen, it's really important. Listen to me. Mail this in. It's my car insurance payment. I said, I got it. You don't have to tell me twice. I heard you the first time. So she leaves. I drive her car around. I feel rich. I feel better. I feel better looking in the car. I enjoy it. Now, about two weeks into this, I walk out to drive her car again, and it's not where I thought I parked it. That's OK. Sometimes, sometimes I forget. <laughs> so I go looking in the other space where I park it. When that space is taken, it's not there either. Hmm. That's OK. Sometimes I have to park it way down over here. So I go way down, down this block, and then I turn on the next block, and then I look on that cul-de-sac, and her car isn't there either. Now I'm beginning to wonder. Where is her car? So I do a search around all the blocks. Her car is gone. It's been stolen. <laughs> wow. So I go into the house, and for the first time ever, I make a call to the police department, 911, and I report the car stolen. And they're like, oh, Toyota Celica, two-door? It's the second most stolen car in all of San Diego County. Hate to tell you this, but if it's been gone for uh, at least 24 hours, it's probably in Mexico already, on blocks, no tires, different color. <laughs> but we filed the report, and we'll get back to you. And as I'm hanging up the phone, I look down at the desk, and I see the letter of car insurance that I forgot to mail in, and I have one of those instant panic attacks. And I open it up praying, and my prayer is not answered because it was her annual car renewal it is now past due, and her car is uninsured because I forgot to mail in the letter. So I decide, like, what do you do in that situation? Do you call her while she's working with these youth, at, you know, at a positive development camp, or do you wait till she comes home? And I think I will just wait till she comes home. No sense in interrupting her positive experience with bad news. <laughs> I'll never forget this. We're at the San Diego airport. My girlfriend comes off of the airplane. I haven't seen her in a month. And it's like one of those romance movies. She's running towards me in slow motion. She's so happy to see me. She's got this huge smile on her face. I'm not quite the same. <laughs> and she lands right near me. She puts me in a hug. And then she backs up to see what's wrong. And she goes, what's the matter? And I go, uh. Well, I got um, bad news and uh, worse news, and I, I don't know which one to tell you first. And she goes, it couldn't be so bad. Like, just tell them, all right, what's the bad news? And I go, your car has been stolen. And then she, go, she looks like she's going to cry for a second. She looks to see if I'm serious, and she realizes I am. And then she just suddenly smiles, and she goes, I'm not going to worry about it. That's what I have insurance for. What's the worst news? And thus begins the tragedy. <laughs> Suddenly she starts crying and pouring forth facts that I never knew about the car before. Turns out she has real feelings about the car. Her real feelings at the time are that it's her only financial asset, that she feels it's her symbol and vehicle to freedom. You know, if everything gets bad in her life and she decides that she doesn't like her boyfriend, she could just drive away. <laughs> Honestly, it turns out that it was a deathbed gift from her grandmother. So she's really upset, to say the least. And two days later, she's, she's like bedridden. She's laying on the couch, and she's depressed, and she's crying. And she told all of her friends that I lost her car and didn't send in the insurance payment because I don't listen. And so I do want to make up for it. I caused a problem. I want to solve it. 
I can't solve it by getting her car back, but I walk up to her and I go, you know, she's, she's sideways like this. So I'm like, honey, I'm going to go to the store for you. I'm going to walk down to Whole Foods. I'm going to get anything you want. What do you want? I don't want anything from you. <laughs> OK, I understand, but I'm going to get you chocolate ice cream. That makes everything better. Do whatever you want. So I, I walk down to Whole Foods. It's two blocks away. And, and, and I walk into Whole Foods. And of course, what I see in the parking lot of Whole Foods is a blue Toyota Celica that looks like my wife's because I am now doomed to see blue Toyota Celicas for the rest of my life everywhere we go, especially when I'm with Deanna, right? And then I look. This is a true story. It is not just a blue Toyota Celica. It's actually my wife's car. It's, the, it's my wife's car. The thief has, is shopping at Whole Foods when I walk there. Absolutely, totally true story. So I have a chance to be the hero of this story. So I decide that I'm going to man up. And I don't really know what that looks like, even. <laughs> but, but I'm going to try it for the first time. And so the car is here, the door to Whole Foods is there, and I get in between the door and the car, and, and, I, and I'm like this, and I don't know whether I'm going to tackle or defend a knife or against a gun or, or beg for the car back, but I'm going to try something when it all suddenly comes flooding back to me. No, the car's not stolen, no. I drove it to Whole Foods, and then I got the groceries, and then I just walked home with the groceries because I forgot I drove it to Whole Foods. <laughs> yes, I'm that guy. I am that guy. I got a lot on my mind. Now you understand the infinity story. I got no credibility at home. Back me up here. Don't look at me like that. Like, women look at me like that, but you're supposed to be like, dude, I understand. But instead, you're like, what the? <laughs> All right, this is a true story. So, but I, I was excited. I, I thought it was good news. I did. So I ran home, and I jumped in front of her. I'm like, oh my gosh, great news. Your car wasn't stolen. I just left it at Whole Foods. <laughs> First words out of her mouth were cuss words. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked. Second words were, give me my ice cream. And I was like, I got a lot on my mind. We all have a lot on our mind, right? So check it out. This guides me. Um, so surgical teams have begun around the world, have begun introducing power pauses. These are one minute pauses of silence right before they do something important in a surgical procedure. Now when first asked to do this, the vast majority of doctors absolutely rejected the idea. But it was done in a controlled, measured situation in the first, ho first eight hospitals. It was forced upon the doctors and the surgical teams. And look at the results. Within months, major complications from surgery fell by 35%. Deaths from those surgeries fell by 47% because of the power of taking a momentary pause of silence. I think it's the greatest possible move in hospitality and customer service. Hi, this is Patrick. Subscribe already, all right? Click that subscribe button.